were singing and dancing. I was also involved in Girl Scouts. I was also involved in uh, church. I grew up in the Catholic church, went to my catechism classes and sang in the church choir and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so I was kind of a little bit of a goody two-shoes, a little bit of a nerd, but proud of it, okay? So, <laughs> um, but one of my hobbies always, my entire life, was singing, dancing, and acting. But my mom was fearful that, um, that if I was to get into that industry, I'd end up, you know, a drug addict or an alcoholic or, you know, you see some of the challenges that the celebrities have. So, she, so my mom would always tell me, like, okay, remember, it's just a hobby, it's just a hobby, just a hobby. And she made, uh, her and my, my dad made it a very um, big deal about, you know, going to school and getting a good education and going to college and whatnot. But I was able to at least um, go to college, UCLA, with my, um, with my hobby, which was um, music. I thought I wanted to be a music teacher, kind of like how when I was in high school, I was in the show choir. Anybody here in like high school choir, band, show choir, anything like that? So I, uh, when I was coming up in high school, I was a part of the, the show choir, and, and it was just a really exciting and fun time in my life. And, um, and I thought, wow, if I could get paid to, to do this and teach other people how to sing, dance, and act, and all that fun stuff, that'd just be so cool. So I went to UCLA, I studied music, I thought it, I wanted to be, um, well, at the time, my, I don't know how to play any instruments, I tried, <laughs> I just was never good at it. I'm like, I can sing, dance, and act, but I cannot play an instrument. Um, I even like rented a piano for like two or three years when, when I was younger, and I just, I'm just not good at it, I don't know why. Anyway, but what I could do was sing, so I w was a vocal performance major at UCLA, and the first year I was there, I had to, um, I had the opportunity to um, kind of, uh, study classical music and sing classical music. I had an opera teacher and learned theory and all this stuff, but it wasn't where my passion was because I grew up in West Covina in La Puente. So I grew up in a multicultural, very diverse, you know, family and neighborhood and, and school and whatnot. And so like, that I just didn't vibe with the classical music. So the second year, at the very beginning of my second year, I ran into a friend of mine who was also a music major and I was telling him how I wasn't all that happy and that I was going to have a meeting with my counselor to talk about other options. And he said, well, I just switched to ethnomusicology. So you should come, you know, do what, uh, you know, take a look at it, you know, talk to him about that. So ethnomusicology was something that was like a specialized major for graduate students, but now they were opening it up as a new major at UCLA for undergrad. So I was what's called a pioneer in the ethnomusicology field <laughs> at UCLA. There was literally like 14 of us. So imagine a school at UCLA, like you, you're told that you're gonna get lost and there's just so many people. There's like, a, a, my classroom sizes were like smaller than this, right? And, um, and it was super cool. But um, what I learned was that, I'm gonna try to make, again, a long story short. What I learned was, um, so I had a job at the UCLA medical, I had the, a job at the Office of Student Affairs for Medical Students. And so for a part of the year, I was involved with the applicants that come through applying to go to med school, and what I learned was there's, even if you end up in med school, you might not have got, had a science degree or whatnot. So my, the point was I realized that your undergrad major doesn't matter as much, it really what matters is what you end up doing like masters and grad school and things like that, and what I learned was every class was hard. Like, did anybody go to college? Like, yes. I think I'm kind of smart, but every class was hard, and I was like, okay, well if every class is gonna be hard, I might as well do something I like, <laughs> right? So that's one of the reasons I stuck with music and whatnot. I, I'm gonna bring, come back to that in a minute when I'm talking about field training because one of the things that's unique about ethnomusicology is people thought it was easy because some of the electives were like, like the electives were easy, I admit it, but like the, the classes that I went to, they expected me to already have the background in music and be able to like write music and read music and transpose music and write songs and all this stuff and then use that information to study music from around the world. Well, similarly, I'm gonna talk about a builder's mindset pretty soon, and what I was thinking about is, in order to be a good builder, you have to be a good producer anyway, but you're just not supposed to stay stuck there. So you're supposed to use all the tools that you have as a producer to turn around and also be a builder. And so it just reminded me of college, like I, I had to use all of my music studies, music skills, to then study ethnomusicology. And so I actually had to know more going into the major, even though people supposedly thought that it was easier. So anyway, but um, when I got out of school, long story short, I did some singing, dancing, and acting, and I did some teaching. Um, I became a substitute teacher, and then I 
became an emergency credential teacher. They handed me my own second grade classroom because I was doing a good job as a sub. And I taught second grade for two years. And while I was there, I, was, uh, I had started WFG part-time. I had quit singing and then started, <coughs> imagine this, I quit singing professionally, but then I ended up recording an album with some friends. Go figure, <laughs> God is funny that way, right? It just fell in my lap. So I'm recording evenings and weekends. I'm doing WFG evenings and weekends. I'm learning how to be a teacher, because imagine, remember, I didn't, I wasn't credentialed. I'm like learning as I go. And yes, I, yes. I went through a couple of years of trying to figure out what direction I really wanted to go to. And what I decided for myself was WFG was going to give me the opportunity to have the lifestyle of a teacher, which means a more like steady lifestyle, more stable, but with the potential earnings of someone in entertainment and the prestige with entertainment. So for me, WFG became something that kind of fulfilled all of my needs, personally. But probably the number one thing that it did for me when all is said and done was the time freedom ended up coming in handy even more than the money. Um, I did increase my income. I used to make like 30 grand a year, and then I worked my way up to 50 grand, 80 grand, 100 grand. I think my biggest year is like 140,000 here. But that was when I wasn't working. I, I made the most money when I wasn't working, go figure. Um, so I'm like, I know that I know that I know that I can make 200 grand or more, you know, as I go through these next, the next year. So um, now that I'm actually working again. So um, again, I'm trying to make this a short story, <laughs> but, but I'm trying to bring, uh, bring it all together back to you. So, um, so when, I, when I, I ultimately quit teaching because I realized that this would do more for me than any other career op opportunity. Also, my mom had a massive stroke. She became fully disabled, and I needed and wanted to spend more quality time with her. And I was feeling pulled between being a teacher and being there for my mom. I told myself, well, I have the rest of my life to be a teacher, but I only have one mom, and I don't know how long she's going to last. So I made that decision to, to be there for her, and then it ended up being a blessing for me in return. Because see, I'm here, and I've been here a long time, and I've been able to uh, help raise my child, be home with him a lot, and now I'm sort of back in the game now that he's six years old, and a lot more independent than before. <laughs> so, um, so my probably the the most valuable. I, I would say the most. Some of my favorite memories from this business, and I don't. I don't say this. You know, we have that story. I don't say this to impress you, but to impress upon you. And I'm serious. <laughs> this is more for um, if you have a dream and you have a goal and you want great things to happen in your life. Um, so these are some of the things that meant a lot to me. So when I first hit SMD, I was excited to hit the title. I'd been trying and trying and trying and trying for a long time. Um, but really, when I think back to hitting SMD, the thing that I'm the most proud of and the most thing that brings me the most fulfillment is that I was at the time singing in choir at church, and I noticed one of my fellow choir <coughs> members was crying after class. And so I, you know, naturally I just went over to her, asked her, are you okay, what's going on? And she was saying that uh, her kids go back and forth between her and the father, and it's her turn to have her kids, but she can't take her kids back because she has no food for them at home. And so she was like, she had to call the dad and be like, you know what, it's okay, just keep them another few days, because she literally didn't know what she was gonna do as far as providing for them. And I was like, and I had just hit SMD, I had a little extra money in the bank, and, um, and I was like, well, I'll take you shopping. Like, I'll give you a ride home. Like, she needed a ride home. And, and I took her shopping. So we went to the store and literally, like, just filled up the basket with anything and everything she wanted. It was probably like 100 to 200 bucks, you know, but which was, it meant the world to her, but it wasn't that much for me at the time. Um, I mean, it's still a lot, but I mean, you know, I, like, yeah. relatively speaking. Yeah. So, um, so I, went to, I went to her home. We unloaded the groceries. She lived with her mom, and her mom was just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing, this is awesome, thank you. So that was like more fulfilling to me than like walking across the stage in Vegas. You know what I mean? Just in terms of personal fulfillment. Um, so you get moments like that that you won't even anticipate. Like you don't even, won't even know that that's gonna happen, but it'll happen. And what's also crazy, I literally just remembered, is like the next week, her mom hadn't been going to church, and like the next week her mom was in church. And that wasn't my intention, I wasn't trying to, manipulate her into getting to church. It was just was like, I don't know, I guess it's like the lady from choir helped us, so maybe I should go to church. <laughs> so that was really, really cool. Um, also, when my dad passed away, my brother and my sister had to go back to work right away. You know, when you, you know, when you have a regular job, you only have so many days to grieve, and then you have to get back to work. 
but I took time off and I was with my mom who's not like not only did she just lose the love of her life, her husband, but she's also physically disabled and can't completely take care of herself. So it was a very frightening, vulnerable, sad period in her life. So I was able to be there with her. And um, and then later on when she was dying of pancreatic cancer, I was able to be there with her. We spoiled her. I didn't spend any time. At, I wasn't around here at all. And that's probably the biggest, it was the biggest income year that I had. Um, and I just focused on being with my family. And then also um, being able to, uh, I had a challenging pregnancy. And then um, raising my child was challenging. And then I've had my own health issues and whatnot. So things have been challenging off and on over the years. I'm sure that if any one of you got up here, you could tell your story of sort of how you ended up here now. But what some of the blessings have been. So I want to challenge you to, to keep dreaming and keep um, believing and keep dreaming and keep going for it. And I'm going to cover this presentation today. And But I want to remind you that this all comes down to why are you here. So... Um, some of you are here because you don't like your job and you don't feel like it's your calling or your purpose or it's not paying you enough or you don't like your boss or you don't like your hours or you don't like the environment or you don't feel like you're making a difference in the lives of others. Some of you are very unhappy with your job. Others of you are happy with your job or you're already self-employed or you're coming out of being like a stay-at-home mom type scenario. And, but you're looking for something that will kind of take you and your income and your business and your dreams to the next level, right? So, um, so take a moment and just jot down a few things that you hope to achieve or accomplish. Let's do short term in 2020. What are you hoping to, what, what would be a dream? Like, I, I like to ask people when they're brand new in the business, so I'm gonna ask you a similar question. Let's say that you stick with this business over the next 12 months, right? And you give it your all, and you come to all the meetings, you make the phone calls, you do things that you're not really comfortable with, you do things you don't really feel like doing. What would make it all worthwhile a year from now? What would make all your efforts worthwhile? Now you might be able to, you're not gonna be able to achieve all your dreams in one year, but like what would make a one year effort worth your while? Strictly Is it huh? Strictly um meaning what like if you were to good question. What I mean is um what are you hoping or expecting this business to do for you over the next year that would make it worth the effort? So maybe it's maybe it's the being proud of yourself by getting a certain title or something like that. But usually it has, let's let's keep it real. Usually it boils down to money and something that you can do in your life, right? So what is this Christmas going to be like versus maybe what next Christmas might be like? Would that be worth your while? Or are you behind in your bills and you want to pay on time or early plus have cushion? Would that make it worth your while? Um, to be able to pay off uh, certain debts, would that make it worth your while? To give your mom $500 so she can enjoy Christmas more, would that be worth your while? Like, think of something that's tangible and specific that would make you, like when you get a little bit discouraged, say, you know what? I'm going to keep going because it's going to be worth it in the end, and here's some of the things that will make it worth it, and that's the things that you're writing down right now. And then now let's look at 2030, 10 years from now. Um, I love that. <laughs> 2030. Um, depends on your mindset. Um, so what, what can you accomplish in 10 years? So let's ask yourself this. If you keep doing what you're doing at your job or your current career outside of WFG, what will your life be like in 10 years? Probably pretty much the same, right? I could be mistaken, but it's just an idea. Versus what if you put your head down and go to work for the next 10 years, or even five years, like, and give it your all, what would life, what could life be like 10 years from now, right? So those are some things that are um, exciting to think about. <laughs> um, and keep in mind, one of the reasons why I'm doing this particular training today, which Christopher asked me to do, but it's so funny that, that like when you're really in the game and you're really focused on the business, literally um, when I heard that Christopher might not be able to make it for general training, I volunteered and said, oh, you know, I'll, I'll make sure to have a training ready if you need it. And literally I was thinking about builder's mindset. So like a builder's mindset versus just like a personal producer or just, you know, just the um, sort of, there's called the higher laws, lower laws, et cetera. So with um, the builder's mindset comes with the same presentation I'm going to do today, which is has to do with the field trainer's mindset. 
And a field trainer's mindset is similar to a builder's mindset. It's kind of like one and the same. So if I say field trainer's mindset or builder's mindset, the idea is how many of you felt like, well, let, let me just share honestly myself. When I first came here, I wanted to know that I could make money with or without a team. Did anybody else feel that way when they first came here? I want to know that I can make money with or without a team. Yes. Okay? And then I realized you can make even more money with a team, and then I sort of got excited about that and then built a team. <coughs> but, um, but here in this business, I, we, we, th we talk about... Um, let me find my markers that I want to use. Oops, I use markers. It's under here. Yep. So raise your hand if you want to help people. And now raise your hand if you want to make money. So check this out. You have how many hours in the day? 2016. Does Steve have more than James? No. Does James have more than Tom? No. No, we all have 24 hours in a day, right? Now, how about you plus team? Now I'm going to use them as examples. Let's pick James. Is it Tom to you? Yes. Do you prefer uh, Thomas? Uh, no, Tom. Okay. And then um, Steve, I said, right? So let's say that James has two people on his team. How many hours a day is his business open? He has two people. Him plus two. Oh, he has uh, 72. What's 24 times 3? 72. 72. 72 is right? I don't know, because I, I use the calculator. Um, so 72 hours. So James has 72 hours in his business when he has himself plus two teammates. If Tom has himself plus five teammates, that's six people doing the business. How many hours a day is his business open? What's six times 24? Somebody bring out a calculator. I'm not sure how that's going. <laughs> One four four, okay. And Steve, let's say Steve has nine people on his team. What's ten times twenty four? Two hundred twenty four. That was an easy one. And then let's say that let's who has the biggest team here? Probably Isabel right now. Gloria. Well, <laughs>
Gracie direct to you? Yes. Okay. And then Vanessa's direct to you? Uh-huh. Okay. Who else is direct to you? Dan. Dan. Okay. Well, Errol's no, Dan as our... Me. <laughs> okay. Oh, awesome. That's right, Errol. Okay. So any other, any other directs at the moment besides, yeah. that who are active besides Gracie, Errol, and Vanessa? Okay. So under Gracie, we have Sylvia. Now, if Sylvia recruited somebody and that person recruited somebody, that would take Gracie's leg 4 deep. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, great. So, and here's the other thing. People tend to get locked into the business when they have a team. So let me ask you this. If, how many of you today coming to the meeting knew that you have somebody on your team here today? Okay. And, how, and for those of you who didn't, there's a different feeling, right? Like there's a different feeling when you're going to the, to the office. Everything from I better be there on time, I better look good, I better do a good job mozoning because I want to be there for my team, right? That's part of it. Then the other thing is you're just quite frankly more motivated when you have people showing up on your team. Same thing for Sylvia. So Gracie, when Sylvia gets back into town, first of all, you need to go wide also anyway, right? Everyone needs to keep going wide. Mm -hmm. But Sylvia is going to be more, more locked in once she gets a recruiter in her, right? Now she's going to feel more compelled to come to the meetings and be successful because she's going to be inspired by who's underneath her. The same thing, Errol has Deanne, or Teresa, but she's not active right now, but she will be, right? But for now, we have Errol and then Deanne. Then Deanne has Sam. There are more people than this. I'm just going to go through. And then Sam, who's somebody that you recruited recently? Uh, Gerardo and Marco. Uh, I'll do an M because it's easier. Yes. Okay, so um, so Errol has one, two, three. So Isabel's gone 4D, and Errol is about to go 4D. So Sam, as soon as you get one of your recruits, um, a new recruit, that'll be taking Errol, uh, Isabel, that'll be taking Errol 4D. Does that make sense? And then Vanessa, does Vanessa have anyone coming to meetings at the moment? Not yet. Not yet? Okay. So right now, here are the, here are the biggest weak spots that, that I would point out would be Isabel needs to get a new direct, Gracie needs a new direct, Errol needs a new direct, Vanessa needs a new direct, Deanne needs a new direct, Sam needs a new direct, and then this guy, Mark, Mark needs a new direct. Um, and then more importantly, this right here, Sylvia needs a direct, he needs a direct, and Vanessa needs a direct. So when you look, when you, <laughs> but when you look at, um, but when you look at your business, this is what you always need to focus on. Go wide and go deep. Go wide and go deep. Some people are focused better on going deep, which like me, I'm better at focusing on going deep than going wide. Other people are better at focusing on going like direct, like maybe Sam right now is more focused on getting direct, more so than going deep, right? But you really need to get a balance of going wide and going deep. And then the other balance is recruiting and producing. So you don't want to just recruit, 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 just to get up here and hold the trophy, and then you don't have a business growing, right? And you don't want to just produce, 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 but then not be duplicating yourself in the field. You want to have the recruiting and producing, just like you want to go wide and go deep, okay? Now, the way that you do this is through field training. And sometimes we get focused on field training to write apps. But we have to remember that we're field training to help build a business for our team. So the way that you do that is you, you make sure to talk to everybody that you meet with about the, like, at least ask them a few questions, just find out if they're at all open to the idea of making more money or um, helping families, things like that. Invite them to the BPM, tell them a little bit about the value of the business, in addition to selling them on why the products and services are so great. Another way to help is to get referrals for your people, right? Always be asking for referrals. So, um, so what we want to do is go deep. Um, while we're field training, help them get more, more people on their team. Now, 3330 is the vehicle to go wide and go deep. The sooner you get to four deep or more, the sooner you will solidify the leg. Now, you guys see why that is. Does that make sense? Oh, also, by the way, in, um, if you look at Christopher recruited Scotty, who recruited Robin, who recruited Keisha, who recruited Lori, and now he left, she left, she left. Who's four deep down? Yeah. Boom, Lori. So Christopher and Lori are still in the business. See how that four deep works? Yeah. Now with Lori, I recruited Maida, who recruited Norma, who recruited Pablo, who recruited Stephanie, who recruited Melinda. Gone, 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 gone. Four deep. Right? 
And then with Nikki Cannon, um, I don't remember exactly, exactly, but I think she was about three deep. She wasn't direct to Christopher right off the bat. So she was about three deep because somebody else recruited her and then I think it was like a recruit and recruit and then Christopher. So, um, so those are just some live examples of going deep. Make sense? Yeah. <laughs> um, if you focus only on three recruits and three sales, you'll lose sight of going deep. Go for deep every time. That is a solid leg that will last a lifetime. So here's a, a big, big challenge. You're always told to lead from the front, true? Sure. So when you're leading from the front, you're constantly thinking, if you're focused on three through 30, you're like, okay, who are my next three recruits? Who should, and the reality is if you get three recruits, you should get three clients. Make sense? Because yeah. anybody who comes into the business should become a client because why, really, let's think about this. Why would I go around town selling life insurance if I don't have life insurance? Why would I go around telling people to save money if I'm not saving money? It's just, it's hypocritical, it doesn't make any sense, it's hard to be congruent, it's hard to speak with conviction. As it is, it's hard enough to get people to come on board and become clients and all that. But if you're not, if you can't even convince yourself to do it, how in the world are you going to build a career, a six-figure career, convincing other people to do it? You're just, you're not, because you're going to constantly, not if you're, not if you're somebody who has a conscience, because you're not going to feel comfortable selling to others what you haven't bought yourself, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So sometimes when your field trainer or your marketing director is like, you need to become a client, you need to become a client, trust me, like, we can go get another sale. Like, whether or not, let's pretend Vivian's on my team, whether or not Vivian becomes my client, I'm gonna survive because I don't, my whole entire life, my whole entire career, my whole entire paying the bills does not rely on Vivian, trust me. But I know that Vivian needs to be a client in order for her to have success in the business. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's my little two cents soapbox for a second. Okay. Um, <laughs> so go for deep every time. Okay, so for you, you want to focus on, um, like, uh, if everyone in this room was focused on 3330, that's powerful, right? But you also, if you, if you want to be a leader, if you want to get promoted, if you want to be a broker in our industry, if you want to make the big bucks, you have to constantly be thinking about your people getting 3330. So, for example, I'm thinking back to when I was uh, doing my best building a base shop. I would do, um, when I first came in for green time, I would do 25 calls for myself and then 25 calls for my team. It wasn't just me, it wasn't just my team. Or even 15 calls for myself, 15 calls for my team. There should always be a balance of personal calls, team calls, personal calls, team calls, personal calls, team calls, okay? Not just one, not just the other. Field training is leading by example, not just making sales or recruits. That seems fair enough. Field trained to crank up speed, jumpstart, or restart the organization. Field trained to increase cash flow. And field trained to tap root and inject momentum and solidify a leg. Field trained to transfer the master copy down to the organization. So let's talk about, let's stay on this page for a minute, please. All right, so let's first talk about, um, I know sometimes it's hard to, um, Sometimes it, it's hard to keep the, the presentation completely duplicable. Duplicable is the right word, but I like saying duplicable. Um, but duplicable, I looked it up, because I was like, duplicable is not a word. Yes, it is, I looked it up. <laughs> it just didn't sound right. But, um, but if, you, if you do, it's, sometimes it's hard to be completely duplicable, because you've seen different people do the, um, the presentation different ways, and so on and so forth. But let's talk about some of the things that are the most, most, most common in any presentation, whether it's an ASAP or a kitchen table um, or a group presentation, okay? Let's talk about... <laughs> um, so what's a common thing, thing that we do with all appointments? So, so first of all, uh, that's a good one. I'm going to say build rapport. On every single appointment, no matter where you are, whether they come here, you go to them, whether you're in a hurry or not, whether you started on time or not, whether they're in a good mood or not, especially if they're not in a good mood, you've got to build rapport. Building rapport is based on finding commonalities, uh, sincere compliments, and, and uh, when I say find common commonalities, find any connection to them. Like, um, let's say I, I'm meeting with a dentist or someone who's a dental assistant. I've never been a dentist or a dental assistant, but I have a client who is a dentist. 
I also have, my mom was a dental assistant when she was younger. My cousin is currently a dental assistant. So like, you couldn't reach the branches out that far. They just, it's just a way to connect with that person, right? You have dogs, make sure, if they have cute little dogs, but you, oh yeah, I have two dogs too. Like rapport is about um, getting to know them as well as sincere compliments, but a, a lot of it is like finding something that you have in common with those people, okay? The other thing is what we call credibility or what I like to call edification. Edify the trainer, on, no matter what kind of appointment it is, always edify the trainer. Um, why do we edify the trainer? Is it because the SMDs were so full of ourselves, we just like for people to say good things about us all the time? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> um, so I've given this example before. So let's say that, um, I'm going to use Gracie as an example. She has two daughters who just got married. Woo. Or I'm going to use your, your son, Joseph. Okay. So let's say Joseph is dating somebody new. And it's the first time she's going to meet the family. She's coming over for Christmas Eve dinner, let's say. Um, and her name is Sally. So Joseph's like, hey, Mom, I'm bringing Sally. And then they show up, and they're like, hey, this is Sally. And everyone's like, hi, Sally, and now what? Everyone's checking out Sally. She has to prove herself, right? What if he calls his mom and says, mom, I met this amazing woman. I can't wait for you to meet her. She's beautiful. She's smart. She has family values. She's the same faith. I know how important that is to you, mom. And I'm going to bring her for Christmas Eve, right? So she's already edifying. He's already edifying Sally. Then Sally shows up. And now he introduces Sally to his dad. Dad, this is Sally. I really appreciate that she was able to come here. She wanted to be with her family this weekend, but she's here with us today. I'm so glad she's here for thanks Christmas Eve. And um, she's the smartest person in the class that I was just in, whatever class it was. Um, man, she makes some great uh, enchiladas, and, um, and she's super family-oriented, and she has a heart of gold. So, Dad, this is Sally. Now, which Sally do you think they're going to like better? Right? The first one where they're like, here's Sally. And now Sally's like, she's trying to like just prove herself. They know nothing about her. They don't know, they, and more, more importantly, they don't know how their son feels about her. Does that make sense? But when the son says, hey, this is a special lady I'm bringing her, and hey, I want you to know how compassionate and how intelligent she is. So now think about the field training appointment. Now, if Gracie takes me in the field and is like, so excited that Bob and Mary are willing to meet with her, and she and let's pretend Gracie's like, oh, this is Lori, my trainer. I'm so glad we're meeting with you today. Okay, go ahead, Lori. Right, that's like an, I'm I'm having to prove myself, right? right? But if she walks in, Bob and Mary, oh my gosh, Bob and Mary, thank I'm glad that we're meeting with you today. I've learned so much from Lori. She's just so amazing. She's a great teacher. She's very successful in our business. She's been teaching me a lot. She's very busy, but I'm so glad she made time to meet with you guys today. Now what do Bob and Mary think of me? And if I'm supposed to be out in the field helping Gracie to get results, am I just helping myself by having good edification, or isn't that in turn going to help her too? Right? She's licensed. She's going to get the split. It's going to put money in her pocket. The better she edifies, think of it this way, you guys. The better you edify the trainer, the more likely your trainer can recruit for you and sell for you. Okay? And get referrals for you. Don't, don't make the job harder than it is by not edifying them properly, okay? And I think that those of you who are trainers, we need to do a better job of explaining this and communicating this to people. Sometimes, this is a little soapbox, forgive me. Sometimes, I'm going to say we, sometimes we're so focused on checking off the boxes and doing what our SMD told us to do and doing, <coughs> doing, 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 doing the things the right way that we're forgetting that you're dealing with a human being in front of you. So, is it Adela mm -hmm. and Eddie? Okay. Eduardo or Eddie? Eduardo. Eduardo. Eduardo and Adela. So, I might get in front of them and be like, okay, we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to do this, we need to do that. But they don't know me from Adam. They don't know that I have their best interest at heart. They don't know me at all. I have to get to know them. I have to find out what are their goals and dreams. I have to explain to them. Here's why I'm going to have you edify me tonight. When we go on the presentation, blah, 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 blah. Here's why we do edification. When we go on the appointment, we're going to do report. Here's why. Blah, 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 blah. At the end of the presentation, um, I don't want you to stay behind and chit-chat with them. Here's why. Da, 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 da. 
Some of you are just expecting people to come in and be your employee, but you're not paying them a wage. You know what I mean? So I know we, we talk about the employee mindset. Well, until you're paying these people with your own money, they're not your employee. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're your business partner. You're working together. You've got to teach them the mindset. Teach them the, the, the training. Teach them the way to do it. Okay? Awesome. Okay. So what's something else that's similar? So I'm just going to go down the list. Build rapport. Build, build credibility. Um, ask questions. Get to know them, right? Um, and then pretty much we have the six steps of the financial needs analysis. So let me hear what are they. Ready, begin. Step one. Cash, 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 cash. Cash. Step two. Cash. Step, cash. Step three. Cash. Step four. Cash. Step five. Cash. Build wealth. Cash. Yes, build wealth or asset accumulation that changed recently. Step yeah. five. Preserve wealth. Yes. Preserve wealth, right? Yeah. So let's do that again. Step one, who's, if you're super confident, say it super loud. Step one is cash flow. cash flow. Good. Step two is debt management. Step three, emergency fund. Step four, proper protection. Step five, uh, build wealth or asset accumulation. And if you ever have something in front of you that says asset accumulation, I like to tell people that I'm meeting with, that's a fancy way of saying long-term savings. Right? Because some people literally will look at it and be like, asset accumulation. They're like, Either they don't know what it is or it's intimidating, right? I don't have any assets. <laughs> so asset accumulation that's step six? Preserve your wealth, preserve your wealth, right? Preservation. So, um, so the six steps of the financial needs analysis are always the same, right? So you might have different um, brochures, different field trainers, et cetera, et cetera, but some of these basic things are always the same. The other basics, typically the power of time, there's different ways to <coughs> convey this. There's different brochures that are available. But the sooner you get started, the sooner you have more money, right? Taxes. We talk, there's a way to comment on taxes through the brochure or through the penny seed million dollar harvest or through the tax we now later never example, right? And then the rule of 72, which is basically has to do with growth, how you want to... When you're saving money, you want your money to grow high interest. When you borrow money, you want to borrow at low interest. Right? That's the bottom line. And sometimes when you do these uh, presentations, make sure to summarize it in a way that makes sense to them. How many of you, when you first came, there were some things that we used to teach that, you, that just didn't make sense to you the first time? Yeah. Like maybe the Rule of 72 or the taxes or different things, right? Mutual funds, et cetera. I was the same way. So... I know that we want to look intelligent in front of our friends and family and clients and prospects and whatnot, but you can look intelligent and then summarize it, make it easy for them, okay? All right. Um, so my point is there's, there's different presentations out there and there's different field trainers out there, but in a nutshell, this is a basic first presentation, okay? Let me give you a basic second presentation. Build rapport again. Review goals again. This is what I see some people skip. Review goals. Outline what you're going to accomplish that day. Because sometimes people, uh, do you know, like you know how we have those six steps. You might want to remind people. I know you. You know, I did a financial needs analysis. I I have something to go over with you. I can leave it with you. Um, but I know that you said the two most important things for you was getting a handle on your cash flow and building long-term savings. Is that still true? Is there anything else you want to add to the conversation today? Okay. Well, I also have, you know, like outline the appointment. Like, here's what we're going to cover today. Here's what we're not going to have time for. Here's what we're going to cover next time, just depending on how, how complex it is. Then review the, um, in a nutshell, review what we call the benefits. You're doing this in data collection. No, this is a recommend is what I'm talking about. I was saying on a, on a second appointment, meaning after. recommend appointment. So this is after you've already collected the data and you're going back to recommend to them. You want to build rapport. You want to review their goals. You want to outline what you're going to cover on the appointment. You want to cover the benefits and features of whatever it is that you're going to recommend to them, the drawbacks of whatever you're going to recommend to them, uh, how it compares to other things. So, for example, most of us recommend an IUL because it makes a ton of sense for the client. 
what most clients don't know is that you've already researched all the other options. So just in general, let me give you an example of what I do when I meet with people. I'll say, there's two different categories of life insurance. There's temporary, which we refer to as term. There's permanent, which we refer to as perk. Term is designed to be there for a certain number of years, like 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years. The amount of coverage stays the same for that period of time. The price stays the same for that period of time. But it means it's going to end, that, that coverage or the price will end after that period is up. So let's say you have a 20 year term. And let's say you're 40 years old. Uh, that means you're going to be covered until you're 60 years old. Let me ask you a question, um, Eduardo. Are you more likely, statistically, are you more likely, you have to say statistically, because I've asked people, are you more likely to die before 60 or after 60? And they go, I don't know. So statistically speaking, are you more likely to die before 60 or after 60? After 60. After 60, right? So there is a little bit of a challenge with this type of coverage in that you're not going to have, <coughs> you might not have coverage when you die. The good news is you're going to have affordable coverage, you're going to be taken care of for the next 20 years. But if you're thinking long term, this is something that we need to keep in consideration. Then, if you look at permanent policies, if you fund them properly, they're designed to be there forever and ever and always. And then, here are the different types of permanent plans that are out there. You have whole life, universal life, variable universal life, index universal life, global index universal life. And now you have extra riders that you can add, like for long term care, chronic, or chronic illness, or critical illness, things like that. So out of all of these plans that are out there, and then um, here's what I recommend for you, and here's why. And then I would go through, so my point is that sometimes we, we get back together with them and we say, hey, I'm gonna show you this IUL and it's gonna be awesome. And sometimes they'll buy it from you, but two days later if they hear about term life, they're gonna be like, hmm, why didn't you tell me about term life? Or three days later they hear about uh, universal life. Wait a minute, why didn't you tell me about universal life? You want them to know that you have access to all of these. You can offer any one of these, but you're choosing this one, and here's why. You give them the reason. And I'm giving you a short version of what I do, but does that make sense? It's kind of like Christopher's yeah. ful fulcrum thing that he does. It's very similar to that. I just do it like this way instead of how he does it. Although his way is the best way. I'm just telling you in a nutshell, it's easy for me. <laughs> um, all right, so my point is that when you do appointments, it's important to not, what I see is, you know, people will walk in, do the FNA, and then recommend the product. But there's a little bit more to it than that, in my opinion, to help set up the appointment properly and to make sure that you, um, they know that you've already taken into consideration other products and services that you could have recommended. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, let's go to the next page. Um, field train to detect a potential new builder or create a recruiting explosion. Um, we talk, you guys ever heard Dan talk about find your rabbit? Yes. Yeah. So what, what that means no. is, okay, I'm going to cover it. <laughs> so finding a rabbit means that there are people who come in that, um, well, I'll tell you the two different categories of people that I've, of, of horse, of people that I've heard of coming into this business. One is a plow horse. One is a race horse. I'll be the first to admit I'm more of a plow horse. I didn't come in with guns blazing and become like number one in any category. I came in and I stead steadily and methodically got better and better and better and better at the business and now here I am 20 years late, right? Um, th that's a plow horse. A race horse is somebody who like comes in, makes a bunch of calls, invites a bunch of guests, gets a bunch of recruits, gets licensed quickly, builds a team quickly, and they do all the right things, but in a shorter period of time. Race horses are what help motivate and drive the office. It really keeps things um, moving and excited and exciting and moving forward, okay? So um, it's okay if you're a race horse, it's okay if you're a plow horse, but if you're a race horse, don't get comfortable being around plow horses. Be a race horse. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Let it go. Um, all right, feel trained to build relationships. Um, I'll tell you this story from, I remember this, Nikki Cannon helped me fill tr uh, Melinda Blue Taylor. So those of you who don't know, there was no MAP program at the time. Melinda was recruited into Nikki's office because she lived closer to that side of town. And I remember that Nikki and her team were helping to fill train Melinda. And one night, um, Nikki just got this gut feeling that 
Melinda was like frustrated or something was bothering her. Or something, they, I think they had an appointment or maybe the appointment didn't go well or something. Like Nikki noticed that Melinda just seemed a little bit off. So she called, or she told me she called Melinda and was like, hey, let's let's pull over, let's go to Denny's, let's talk. And so she had, so she built a relationship. She, she already had somewhat of a relationship with, with Melinda, but she took the time to pay attention to Melinda's mindset and knew that she needed some extra coaching or some extra right. assistance at the time. And so she took the time to literally pull over, spend time with her, and invest in somebody. And that obviously has helped to solidify Melinda in the business for many years to come. I don't, you know, she probably would have stuck around even if that conversation didn't happen, but sometimes those little things, they really add up and they mean a lot to people because people want to know that they're a business with people who care about them. And it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to, to do it, right? You have to take the time to get to know people, spend time with people. Um, I'll give a couple examples. When I first came back into the business a few months ago from just sort of being on a timeout, not a timeout, that sounds like I was in trouble. Um, a sabbatical. I sabbatical. I was on a sabbatical. sabbatical. And I came back and then, you know, and Christopher asked me to help field train some people. I was noticing in the language that, that like Christine, I called Christine and, and she was willing to meet with me and, and do like a redo on her fast start. She was like, oh, well, you know, I'll meet you halfway. I'll make it easy for you. And I was like, well, I appreciate that. But that's not the system. The system is we go to your home, I meet the spouse, <laughs> we're in the comfort of your own home, we build a relationship, I get to know you and your spouse, and we go from there, right? So make sure that you're not so make sure you're not so busy that you're skipping steps or that you're trying to make it convenient for yourself or others. Do the business as it's laid out, as it's designed, because you're gonna end up getting more results that way. Does that make sense? All right, cool. Um, Lori, yes, and you're also training the person too. Like when you set the example, like this is the way the system goes. Point. You're also training them to do it, so the yes. system doesn't get watered down. Yes, yeah. <laughs> very good, true. <laughs> it makes it more duplicable. <laughs> so um, awesome. Oh, well, can you go back to that same one? Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, feel trained to build relationships. Feel trained to earn the right to ask your people to go out in the field. This is another one. Um, so, if Tom, who's your upline? Steve. Steve. Kute? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, Steve Kute recruits Tom. And now you're married, Tom. What's your last name? Yeah. Oh, that's my mom's name. Oh. My mom's name. That's, that's good. Does she go by Liz or Liz? Uh, Liz. Oh. Okay. So, Steve recruits Tom, and he's married to Elizabeth. So Steve gets to do business on Tom and Elizabeth, meaning even if Tom's licensed, he's not supposed to write business on his spouse. Um, Steve is supposed to write business here. Also, anything that's in the, uh, any underage children, uh, I'm going to say kiddos to reflect under 18, any policies sh should be that are done on the kids should also go, Steve should be the field the, uh, writing. the writing agent, yeah. Steve should be the writing agent for Tom and Elizabeth's uh, policies and savings plans and 529s and all that stuff and the kids, right? Now, um, that way, when Tom turns around, he recruits seven different people over the next 90 days. Now, he's earned the right to become the writing agent on all of their stuff, right? Mm -hmm. If everybody wrote business on their own family, you'd run out of business because everybody's being focused on doing the same thing. Right? Mm -hmm. But you give up one to get dozens. So say that after you after me. Yeah, you give up one, give up one, one to get dozens. dozens. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, um, now I had a conversation with Gracie recently. She has grown children. So I said, well, I think the most fair thing is that um, me and Isabel are, the, uh, it's appropriate for me and Isabel to be on the apps for these people. But if you take me in the field to meet with your grown kids and their families, then I'll split that business with you. Because they're considered, anything outside of the immediate family, I consider that like a regular field training appointment, whether they're related to you or not. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm just yeah. talking about the immediate household is really what we focus on as far as the training and stuff. Okay. Um, field trained to earn the right to ask your people to go out in the field. Also, um, so imagine if Warner came in the business, refused to do field training appointments, mm -hmm. and then now he's like trying to convince everybody he recruits to go take them in the field. 
Would that make sense? No. No. So again, you give up your own warm market in order to be able to work in the warm markets of everybody you recruit for the rest of your career. In fact, I'm going to show you my... I love this example. Okay, so let's say that... Uh, so let me start with this. If you were to... If you had no... If you had an unlimited budget, and in 2020 you wanted to have either a huge birthday party or a, like an anniversary party, um, what's if you have no budget, how many people would you invite to this party? Three. Give me a number. You had no budget. If you have if you have an unlimited budget, how many people would you invite to this event? Three hundred. Who who else has? Two hundred. Two hundred. Thousands. How many? Thousands. Thousands, okay, I like that. <laughs> Thousands. Um, when me and my husband first brainstormed our uh, wedding list, it was 500 people, and we stopped at that because we're like, okay, we know we're not going to invite 500 people, so let's stop now. We ended up inviting 200. But here's my point. 200. If you have a guess. <laughs> if you have a guess. So it's fair. And then, have you guys ever, I'm going to be really crazy now. Have you ever been to a funeral before? Yes. yes. How, how many people typically show up from, for, with all the festivities combined? How many people typically show up to a funeral? It varies, but maybe 50, maybe 100, 200, 400. Right? So, it's, so it's very, very, very reasonable to say, it's very reasonable to think that any new recruit would have 100 people that they know. True? True. Yeah. Everybody, stand up. Stop three times. Have a seat. Take deep breath. Refocus. We're in the whole stretch here. Let me just finish this up, okay? Um, okay, so let's pretend Sam has a new associate. Yes. He talks to me about building a top 100 list. Yes. Now that we've, now that I've given you those examples, is it extremely reasonable to think that any human being, any adult human being, probably builds 100 or more people? Yes. Okay. So let's say that he sits down with his new recruit, Bob, and Bob creates a list of 100 people. Okay. Out of that hundred, we ask them to narrow it down to the first, to the top twenty-five that we're going to call first. Out of that top twenty-five list, let's say ten people say that they'll go ahead and come to a meeting or do an appointment. Okay? Let's say out of those ten people who actually take a look at the business, that three of them become new business partners, or VPs. Um, three of them, no, four of them become clients, and the other three do nothing except for give referrals. So if they, if he has three new business partners, what kind of a list has he just created for himself and his business? 300, uh, 300 lists, right? Because they should each have 100. Uh, if he got four new clients, and let's say each client gave an average of five referrals, that's 20 referrals, right? If three of them gave them two referrals, that's six, right? So check this out. Um, Sam's new person, Bob, potentially just gave up 10 potential um, clients right now, right? A scarcity mindset is, oh my God, I'm giving up 10, I'm giving up 10, I'm giving up 10, and people stop and they quit the business, right? But here's what really happened. He gave up 10, he gained 326, and he still has 90 more people to go talk to. So now that's not going to happen. So he went from, he gave up 10, and he now has 416 people to go after. Was it worth giving up 10? Yes. And now, for all 416 people he follows up with, if all of them were willing to give up 10 field training appointments, that's 4,160. Was it worth it? Yes. Okay, so that's how our business is supposed to work. But you have to get used to explaining it in a way that people will not just understand, but like, buy, like really enjoy and buy into Like, oh, that's why. Right? Because now, when Bob goes out and recruits three more people, now Bob has earned the right to field train. Well, if he, he, he's too new, no. But anyway, when you become a field trainer, then you earn the right to go out on 10 field training appointments with all these other people, right? It's awesome, I'm telling you. Okay? It works. Um, it works. It works. <laughs> Um, feel trained to run the system, not talk about the system, create a habit of action, duplication, and coachability to the new training. So, um, it's, all of us who are SMDs have for sure run the system before. But I admit that sometimes we're in and out of the game, and sometimes we're doing it more than others, etc., etc. 
But if you want to be a strong field trainer, it's not about just telling people what to do. You have to go do it with them. That's why I've been a big fan the last couple of months. I'm like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. So I'm making calls for people. I'm running uh, interviews for people. I'm doing ASAP appointments. I'm doing Zoom appointments. I'm doing uh, field training appointments, client appointments, all of that stuff, because it's a win-win for everybody involved. Listen? Cool. All right, next. So, um, I know this was, a, this week was a distraction, right? There's a little thing called Thanksgiving, and it's possible, even though it was Thanksgiving, a lot of us still had guests, we still had appointments, we still had activity, uh, but if you somehow, some way, got distracted from setting up your schedule for the next week, I would highly, highly encourage you to not go home until you get some appointments in your schedule for next week. Make sure to work with a trainer. If, you, uh, if you're not an actual validated field trainer, make sure you're working with a trainer to make those calls because you must have appointments lined up for the next three to seven days. You must book at least three appointments a night, overbook or double book in case of cancellations. If you don't have appointments next week, have a sense of urgency, turn into a state of emergency. In the worst case scenario, drop by or stop by with a new associate. You are one recruit away from an explosion. So um, the stop by, drop by would be if Let's say, Gracie, you and I are having trouble calling people and getting people live on the phone, but you have some, let's say you have some family members who you're allowed to just show up and knock on the door and pop in or give them a call like, hey, I'm in your neighborhood, I'm coming by in five minutes. Then you go with your field trainer, you just knock on the door, just say hello, introduce them to me, and then we just have a brief exchange, and then it makes it that much easier. Be like, hey, you know, I, I, we were out running appointments together, I'd love to come by and see you guys sometime, obviously we don't have time today, but is this generally a good time for you? What if we came by next week and we just hung out for about 30 minutes? I can show you what I'm up, what I'm doing, what I'm up to. That's called a stop by, drop by. All right. And then um, you're one recruit away from explosion. Um, it is what it is. Like you, you have no idea who's going to come into your business and who's going to stay and who's going to go. You don't know who's going to win, who's going <coughs> to not win. <laughs> you have no idea. So it's best to. Just keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, because you're one recruit away from exposure. Okay, next. Is that the last one? Oh no, a couple more. Trainer Credo. Read this out loud. Ready? One, two, three. I know the only way I'm successful is training with the gaming trainers. I know exactly how to win. whatsoever so just make sure to get that done just I know it's easy to put off I'm, I'm she says that I, I'm one of the best communicators even I feel like I've fallen behind sometimes 
But um, just make sure that you don't use any excuses. Just be respectful, be kind. Evelyn, I'm telling them to, that they have no excuse not to fill in BSC Pro yes, and report you. their apps. <laughs> thank you. Yes. So if you get 25 in one week and you have problems, then give one. Then reach out and ask someone for help. Otherwise, if you're doing under 10 apps a week, there's no reason why you can't um, fill that in and, and keep it updated. Sound good? Yes. 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 So now say, I will get 10 apps a week. I will, I will get 10, ten apps a week. week. I will get 10 recruits this month. I will, I will get, get 10, 10 recruits this month. month. I'm fired up. I'm fired up. I'm fired up.